All right. We are back with our Friday financial wrap up with Mr. Michael Zuber. How are you, Michael? I'm doing very well. How are you? I'm doing well. So today is October the 28th, 2022. Let's get right into it. Let's talk about Q3 GDP. What is GDP? For some people that may, this may be a new term. What is GDP? And then what happened in Q3? So GDP stands for gross domestic product. It is essentially accumulation of all the goods and services uh, that a country produces. So we get a quarterly report. Uh, GDP is very important in Q3 because Q1 and Q2 were negative. Uh, for reference uh, or for memory, Q1 was negative 1.6. Q2 was negative 0.6. And there was quite a bit of fear that Q3 would also be negative. It wasn't negative. It was positive. Uh, expectations from uh, the powers that be had it at 2.4. It actually came in above that. It came in at 2.6. So uh, a couple of things, um, which obviously not the third quarter of negative growth. It's positive. And also it takes the year positive because again, if you add 1.6 and 0.6, you get 2.2. Uh, we just had a positive quarter of 2.6. Uh, so for the year now, uh, the U.S. is growing, and that's important for a couple of reasons. First off, the rest of the world is not. It doesn't feel that way. Europe is certainly in a recession. Uh, one would argue that China is in a recession. Uh, so again, uh, there's, a, there's a reason that the U.S. economy, is, 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 is job market appears strong and consumers are still spending. And you know, Q3 was a positive number. And um, yeah, it's just uh, if there was a recession coming, it did not start in Q3. Q3 is... You don't grow 2.6 and call it a recession. So uh, we'll see what happens in Q4. Uh, but Q3, 2.6, positive number. Positive number. So let me ask you, what would, um, when you think about the Fed and you think about interest rates and you think about policy and such, how, how do you think the Fed looks at that GDP number? Or how do they, how does that, how does that formulate into their equation with the Fed rate? Just any, yeah. any, any impact? That's a great question. So really, when you look at this, if the number was negative, let's say it was negative and accelerating. So what does that mean? Well, last quarter was negative 0.6. Uh, let's say it was negative 1.6. So it's getting progressively worse. That would probably give the Fed pause to slow down. Like, hey, that's the third quarter in a row. It appears to getting worse. That might give them reasons to slow down. Uh, the fact that it wasn't negative and the fact that it was positive and now takes the year positive certainly doesn't slow them down. You know, Fed rates, six month delay. We really started raising in March, I think. Maybe it was February. Um, it certainly doesn't slow them down. That that much is that much is true. OK, we'll keep it moving. We'll keep talking about it. Let's talk about PCE. What is PCE and what happened this week with PCE? So PCE is personal consumption expenditure. It really is only important in the fact that it's the most important inflation gauge that the Fed looks at. You and I talk about CPI because it's what you and I feel at the grocery store, at the gas pump, right? Uh, but the Fed looks at this personal consumption expenditure and it came in low. It actually is trending down. Uh, I, from memory, I think it peaked at six. I think last month was four, eight. This month it was four, six. So it's trending down. That number is important because... There's a lot of people that say the Fed funds has to get above inflation. Well, if you don't finish that sentence, you can confuse people. Because when you say inflation, you're like, which inflation? Is it CPI? Is it PPI? I believe the Fed has to get the Fed funds rate above PCE core. That, again, was 4.6. So um, if you watch my channel, One Rental at a Time, you know that I think the Fed's terminal rate has to be between 4 5 and 5%. I lean towards 5%. Uh, but, you know, if PCE core is 4 6, it's kind of right in that range. There are some people that say the Fed has to get above inflation and then they say CPI. I don't think that's true. Could it happen? Sure. Uh, but I don't think you're going to see the Fed funds at 9% as an example. That's that would be taking it too far, in my opinion. Very interesting. And for any viewers or listeners, I would encourage you to stay till the very end because we're going to talk about the impact on the mortgage rates, what to expect, especially going forward over the next six months. Let's continue. Bank of Canada. What happened this week with Bank of Canada? 
So Bank of Canada is interesting because it's the second central bank uh, that delivered less than the market expected. So what does that mean? So Bank of Australia was first. Bank of Canada followed about three or four weeks later. So what happened is the market, their stock market, uh, their financial market expected in both cases, 75 basis point move. Uh, but the banks or the central banks only gave them 50. So again, that is the classic Fed pivot. The Fed, the market wanted, you know, three quarters. The market only got 50. And thus the markets are off to the races because they're like, yay, Fed pivot. Now there's a lot of people looking at the market today saying, will the U.S. pivot? Uh, I think that's wishful thinking, but that's what the market is thinking today. Bank of Australia, Bank of Canada, could we be next? That said, the ECB, Europe Central Bank, uh, came out and gave a full three quarters. So they've uh, doubled their rate. Uh, it was 75. Now it's 150. So uh, we shall see. Uh, we, have our, we have our Fed rate increase on November 2nd, I believe. So next week, I think it's next Wednesday. I think it will be three quarters. Uh, but there's people hoping. Uh, that they pivot and and only do fifty, but uh, I think that's wishful thinking. Got it. So and so just so I'm really clear, you believe again next week, next Wednesday, November the second, Fed will likely we believe three quarters of a point, seventy five basis points versus fifty basis points, a half a point basically. Is yeah. that yeah yeah I think that's right. I think the market uh, last time I saw was eighty eight percent on seventy five and twelve percent on fifty. Uh, I think the Fed and Jerome Powell um, are not even considering anything less, but you know, we'll see next week. Do you feel like follow-up question on that? Do you feel like um, that that's already baked into the stock market that in terms of pricing, in terms of volatility, that that will not be a surprise 75 basis points? Yeah, it certainly won't be a surprise. 50 would be a surprise in my opinion. Got it. Okay. Very interesting. Well, stay tuned for next week. Um, we're going to talk about mortgage rates here in a minute, but I want to talk about new home sales. What did you see this week in new home sales? Yeah, new home sales uh, were better than expected. They were just over 600,000. I think expectations were 580. I think what's going on in the new housing market is you actually have home builders doing what Target and Walmart would do, right? If you were Target and Walmart, you had a bunch of TVs on the shelf that weren't selling, you would discount them. So I think home builders is doing that. I'm hearing from all over the country, builders are giving discounts, uh, but you know, doing upgrades, all of this stuff. So I think what's happening is builders are blowing out inventory, so they get smaller, uh, and they're building less. So this 90 day window or whatever it will prove to be, you'll see kind of above trend sales, uh, but builders will earn less money, right? Because they're they're eating margin. They're they're you know their earnings per share will go down. I think builders are in. Um, they're retreating. And part of the retreat is to get smaller and sell anything that's finished. Uh, that's the only thing I could think of because rates are so high. Well, I mean, I don't know. I don't know why they would surprise to the upside, but I think it's just because they're discounting, in my opinion. Very interesting. Very interesting. We'll keep an eye on that. Um, it makes sense that builders would get lean. This is a time for, I think, a lot of businesses to get lean. Makes a lot of sense. Let's talk about mortgage rates. What did you see this week? And then mm -hmm. let's tie it all together with the GDP, obviously the Fed rate next week. What are you seeing this week for mortgage rates and your thoughts going forward? Yeah, there's, so we're going to talk about mortgage rates and something I didn't give you is also yield curve inversion. We're going to talk about that too. Uh, but first off, mortgage rates this week went over 7.3%. Uh, but on Wednesday uh, of this week, they started to crash. The 10-year was at 4.3. Now it's at 3.94 last mm -hmm. time I checked. Uh, so mortgage rates have come down. They're sub seven. Uh, one of the brokers told me this morning and they're just all over the place. And I think this is part of folks thinking that we have a recession coming. There's a, there's an indicator called the yield curve inversion. You and I've talked about it. We call it the two and 10. Yep. That's where the two year note pays more than the 10 year note. That yield curve inversion is fairly accurate at pointing at a recession, but there's one that's even more accurate. And it just happened yesterday. That's when the three month is above the 10 year. Think about what that means. You could borrow money for 10 years cheaper than you can borrow money for three months. That is a pretty good indicator that a recession is in the offing uh, out six, nine, 12 months. And that just happened. I checked early this morning. It's still true. 
So, um, yeah, the three month and the 10 year inverted, uh, the 10 years crashing, which brought mortgage rates down. It's just, I would not want to be in the mortgage business today because rates are all over the place. And um, it's going to be, it's going to be a wild ride. I think the next uh, three to four months is the fed takes us and then hopefully flattens out for the, for the rest of the year. Very interesting. So let's talk about follow just a follow-up question on that. So with the fed next week, next Wednesday, November the 2nd, we expect 75 basis points. Do you see the mortgage, the 30 year mortgage moving in correlation or do you see, do you see it bounce uh, up? Do we see it go to seven and a half? Do we see seven and seven no, and three quarters? Uh, no, I don't think so. I think most of the Fed, I, the beauty about the mortgage market is it moves early. The mortgage market moved three weeks ago when it saw 75 coming. Uh, it is very interesting to watch it today because of the Bank of Canada, as we talked about earlier, I think there's some wishful thinking. Uh, so we may get some of that back, but no, we're not going to get a one-to-one -one ratio. Uh, most of that's already uh, already baked in the cake. Very interesting. And then also, too, just a follow-up. Right now, if we look week by week, we have a very volatile market. One day it yeah. could be 7.3, like you said, and then the next day you're talking about you know 6.87, 6.9, something like that. Is that pretty yeah. accurate? Yeah. I mean, it's uh, again, I want to stress this is not normal. I would not want to be in the mortgage industry. You, it's not uncommon to get daily adjustments, but to get three or four adjustments in a day is pretty uncommon. And people in the mortgage industry that I talk to every week are like, it's, it's you know, two or three resets a day is is pretty common. It's 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 a wild market. Got it. And then the last part, let's talk about this. Is I think we'll do we'll finish today's episode on opportunity and obviously good news. Tell us about deals on the MLS. What happened this week? Yeah. So if you've ever read my book, One Rental at a Time, you know that I build our portfolio, the lion's share of our portfolio while working a full-time job. And other than two properties, our entire portfolio was built out of the MLS, multiple listing service. Think realtor.com, Zillow, Redfin. Again, 99% of the purchases we did for 20 years were out of the MLS. Uh, unfortunately, like everyone else, the last three years have been tough. And, you know, I have a buy box just like I teach and I talk about. I looked at my buy box for every day for three years and I wrote some offers, but I didn't get any deals. That changed uh, last week. I got a deal right out of the MLS. It was available to everyone. It was listed for a long time. I wasn't lucky, right? It was there for weeks. People, other people could have written an offer. And uh, yeah, we're going we're gonna to write a deal. Uh, I close on Monday. Um, this will be a flip, uh, conservatively speaking, uh, I'm looking to, to make 32% cash on cash return. Uh, I am doing my first JV, uh, with someone, uh, Adam, uh, in Fresno, uh, who's part of the hub because I, I, I want to encourage more and more people to hunt and look, uh, for deals. So, um, yeah, I'm ecstatic. I mean, I cannot tell you how good it feels to get a deal out of the MLS Getting deals from your network and from wholesalers, it's nice. But as somebody who teaches buy box discipline, getting a deal out of the MLS again is just amazing because I know it works. I know we're going there. P competition is disappearing. People are freaking out and afraid. And I just look forward to buying more and more deals right out of the MLS just to prove I can. So, um, yeah, I'm so excited. I'm so excited. I love it. Well, folks, you've heard it here. The market is shifting, obviously a lot of changes, a lot of uncertainty, but within that uncertainty, an incredible opportunity for all of you out there. Deals are now happening on the multiple listing service. There's more opportunity. And again, we're still in the middle of the storm, but again, we're going to start to see things level off as we get into a new year. Uh, Michael, thank you for all that you do. Where's the best place? I want to promote your course. Your mm -hmm. course, I think, is one of the best values for people that are teaching, people that are new, people that are seasoned and experienced. I bought your course. I'm a member of your course and your program. And that's how we've gotten to know each other. Where can people find out about your course? Yeah, you go to just one rental at a time.com, which is my public website. You can see the courses there. If you want to follow me on YouTube, there's links in the description. Yeah, I have to tell you, it's a ridiculous price. 320 bucks uh, gets you all of what I do. All these bonus sections get you 
uh, deep dive sessions. Also get you added to a Facebook group, which you are part of. Thank you for responding to folks with all my experts. Uh, it's the happiest place on the internet. Uh, more and more people are talking about getting deals done in the MLS. Uh, it's, it's, um, it is so fun to watch people do the work and succeed and win. Uh, it's, it's awesome. I love it. I love it. Also, as we're going into the last weekend of October, we still have a few tickets for those of you, if you're interested, November 19th, we have Pace Morby, Jamil Danji. It's going to be epic. It's going to be November the 19th. They can go to reicollaboration.com. There are some, there are still tickets available. This is not a hype. Tell them about this event. What, what's the benefit? Who benefits from this, the proceeds? And maybe just how this all came together, Michael. Yeah, there's a couple of things. So kind of uh, how this coming together, uh, Ty and I didn't met in Fresno, went, went and checked out the hub and did some work. Uh, we happened to be there when Jason Pritchard, Stratton and Dean were putting on an event. Uh, we introduced you and uh, <laughs> I had a crazy idea. Why don't we have a, a capstone of the year and do an event together, uh, which everybody agreed to in five minutes, which was awesome. Then we got in a, a venue secured. You got Pace and Jamil come to headline it. Uh, so it came together very quickly, uh, which was awesome. We've now learned that maybe we want more time next time <laughs> to put together an event because the location was tough. Uh, lesson learned. Uh, but who's who's going to benefit is anybody who wants, anybody who knows real estate investing is the way to wealth. Yep. But you just want to be around people that are actually doing it and actually go-givers. So what you're going to see at the event, not only is patient Jamil, which you're going to talk for hours, which is going to be amazing. You're going to see Henry Washington from Bigger Pockets fame be there as well. You're also going to get at least two panels. You're going to get a panel where we put up operators who are having to change their business. They're going to tell you exactly what you're, they're doing. We're going to have another panel talking about mindset. How the hell do you have a mindset where everything is breaking and changing? How do you just get up and move forward? Uh, it's going to be uh, epic and, and move forward. So uh, I'm going to be there with the uh, notepads ready to take notes. Uh, if you bring your one rich at a time books, I'll sign them for you. Take selfies, whatever you want. It's uh, I am so looking forward to that event on the 19th. I love it. Super excited for November 19th. There are some tickets available. REI collaboration.com. Also all proceeds, any net proceeds, all net proceeds is going to a local nonprofit. So it's going to benefit the community. This is all about collaboration. It's all about community. Michael, thank you for all that you do. Thank you for all that you share. Awesome, buddy. Thank you.